as this was a, a legal sort of uh, emphasis, what I want to understand is if Vic Roads asks a driver to get a medical assessment and then the driver takes that to their GP and the GP makes an assessment, what additional legal risk is that GP or for that matter me as a specialist in a Cadham's clinic exposed to when I say yes you can drive? I mean, it's all right to talk about, oh yeah, you can just ring up and say, oh yeah, you can just sort of hide away behind the, the privacy and say, yeah, sure, you know, we want to get rid of this guy's licence. But I want to know, most of my people I manage in the, in the memory clinic with MSC scores of 26, um, I think are quite safe to drive. But I don't do an on-road assessment to prove that. Um, I make a clinical assessment. And until the rules have just changed, it was the, the Osroad rule said if there was an impairment sufficient to interfere with driving. Now it's not, can't have an unconditional licence, you've got to go and get a conditional one. I want to know what exposure we have now as medical practitioners if we don't do an on-road assessment and we say they're safe to drive, not what exposure I have if I say they're not safe to drive. I'll, um, oh, I'll talk first and then hand over, over to Morris. Um, when you're filling out that medical report form, you, you, you're not saying fit to drive, you're saying it meets the medical guidelines for fitness to drive or, or doesn't, and then Vic Roads is making a decision. You can tick the box to s recommend an, an OT on road driving test, but at the end of the day, we're weighing up the information on the medical report with all the other information we have, be it a police report or whatever else came in, and working out whether that person needs to go for an on-road test or not. Sometimes there's conflicting information. Sometimes the re police report will come in and say that this driver can't drive to save themselves, and the medical report comes like, oh, everything's fine, hang on a minute. And in that case, we'd probably do an on-road test. But uh, yeah, you're, you're not making the decision on fitness to drive, uh, we are. You're just saying, do they meet the medical guidelines for fitness to drive? In other words, is there anything wrong with this person that you think is, is, not gonna, is going to be able to affect their driving? So I, I guess the, the thing that I was going to open up with, is the problem real of older drivers? So we've heard um, already that the proportion of deaths of older drivers isn't uh, a different distribution, um, that different <coughs> groups have a different level of risk. Is it that we're just worried about the legal consequences? Um, uh, and is that what Mark Yates has articulated for us, is that you know, we're very nervous about driving because should something go wrong, we'll be held to account as the, the health professionals? Look, I think that um, the, the, the thing that you've got to bear in mind is that it is Vic Roads that makes a decision and Vic Roads makes it on the basis of medical information and the more information that Vic Roads gets, the better quality decision that they're going to be able to make. Um, there's a revision going on at the moment of the form that gets sent out to doctors for medical information once uh, they've become known to Vic Roads and the revised form's been trialled with focus groups of GPs and so on and it's much more detailed than the current form and the intention of it is to get better information so that Vic Roads can make better quality decisions. Um, I don't think that doctors uh, are going to get in trouble for providing accurate information about their patients. Basically, what you know about, you can put on the form and, and you know, ultimately, I suppose, if you think about it with a lawyer's hat on, if this ends up in court, all they can do is get your notes and you know, perhaps check and see that what's in your notes is on the form. And if there's correspondence there and if you've done the right thing and been honest and given Vic Rhodes the best possible information, note that I don't necessarily say uh, advice but information, then that's fine. People get into trouble for not disclosing appropriate information. That case in 2006 um, in New South Wales uh, was a case where a doctor told the patient something but didn't tell the, the um, licensing authority the same thing. And where that sort of thing happens, then obviously you can get into a bit of trouble about it. But um, I think that if you do the right thing and provide as much information as possible, and, and that might mean getting a phone call from someone like me to discuss it, then uh, doctors aren't putting themselves in danger. In fact, any other health professional is not really putting themselves in danger. Well, look, we get lots of doctors who um, will send things into Vic Roads, you know, will send forms into Vic Roads, and, and um, Vic Roads will send them on to us because they seem to be a bit uh, uncertain or perhaps there's some contradictions in them. Sometimes you ring up the doctor and say, look, I'm a Vic Rhodes medical advisor and I'm just ringing up about Mr. So-and-so. And they say, oh, thank God you've rugged me about him. You know, he shouldn't be driving. Why didn't you say so? Well, he was sitting right in front of me at the surgery and I really didn't feel I could. So, you know, sometimes people write 
I would be happy to discuss this in person if necessary. We see that as a code for please ring me up and get the real truth about things. The other, um, the other um, um, areas where we get to talk to doctors is where doctors actually do ring us up and they get given our phone number by Vic Rhodes Medical Review. Okay. There's a phone number on the form that you know, people can always ring up Vic Rhodes Medical Review and if they want to talk to us, they can be given the number and we're totally happy to answer any questions. Well, my doctor's been my doctor for 20 years, so I don't think he's nervous at all. Would you go back and see him if he, well, if he, yes, if if you disagree with his reporting you know, to, to Vic yes, Rhodes? I'd still go and see him. I'm one of four lead clinicians in cognition in town. And I've got a 65-year-old farmer who lives out uh, the bush who's got an MSE score of 26. He's still harvesting and he's still doing all the things he wants to do. And I've said, I don't think you need a driving assessment at this point. Where do I stand? If he then had an accident, might right now, and I put him, so I'm at here, I'm maybe, am I out on a medico-legal limb right now? He goes and has an accident. Stop there, let's... Where, where am I? Look, I don't think that you're out on a medical legal limb. If you can justify your opinion that this chap doesn't need to have an assessment and, and, and have it all documented adequately in your notes, and that's fine. I think it's also important to realise that the medical review process can't aim to prevent every crash. I mean, people will have crashes. People will go and see, you know, a top specialist, uh, you know, go and have a specialist OT assessment, all the rest of it, whatever it might be, and the very next day they might have a crash. You cannot predict all crashes. Uh, to a certain extent they're unpredictable and there's all sorts of odd conditions that can contribute to them. And so it's unrealistic to expect that any medical opinion will be absolutely 100% correct. What, what people want to see is that opinions are based on professionalism and a reasonable amount of data that's caused you to come to that decision. And um, if that can be recorded and, and can be documented, then Nobody can be criticised for that. All you can do is your best. Oh, so I guess what I wanted to say to Mark was, I suppose what we're asking, or what Vic Rhodes is asking you to fill in on that form, is not your determination or your estimation of whether that person is safe to drive. It's not. Re I know it. It seems confusing because you are making an assessment or. Um, about the person's skills in relation to driving, about their medical conditions that could impact on driving, but that ticker box thing at the bottom that I know raises the anxiety a lot, which basically there's two questions that say you have to complete both of these questions. One of them is, does the person meet the medical guidelines to drive a car? And do they meet the medical guidelines to drive a truck? And I know that's the one that you hate, that bit, and you usually write, pending OT assessment or something like that in there. What the GP is saying is that in that blue book, this person doesn't have any of those medical conditions um, that is going to preclude them from driving. So there are some set conditions that say, this means you cannot drive. And so the doctor's role is to find those people and say, according to that blue book, do they meet the medical guidelines to drive? Not, I'm guaranteeing by signing this form that they're never going to have a crash for five years. It's not the same thing. If someone has a dementia, now we're taking a unitary at the moment form of dementia because that's what, the, that's what Osrose has said. Any dementia, doesn't matter whether they've got an MSE score of 30, as long as they've got a memory problem, there's an abnormality in one cognitive domain, however mild, you know, that's a dementia in, in, in medical language. And, and they're saying then that's a, an un, there has to be a conditional licence only. And I'm expected to tick a box. The whole reason, I, this piece, I haven't got anything wrong with their eyes, their, no diabetes, no cardiac failure, not had epilepsy, not anything else. The only reason that there's a concern is because they have a dementia. Isn't that as equally as a medical condition as much as cardiovascular as anything else? So then you still have to tick the box to say that, that they, have, they meet the criteria. If they want to say they meet the physical criteria to drive, rather than the cognitive criteria, I'm happy with that. But on the one hand, I'm asked to say they can drive. On the other hand, that they, um, or they're safe to drive. On the other hand, I'm saying I don't want an OT assessment. But to me, that's not the problem, because I'm, the time problem I have is that it goes around in jolly circles. If I say I want an assessment, you know, or is, I write to Rick Rhodes and say, I think this person is unsafe 
maybe, it, gonna, it comes back round again to say, can I see a geriatrician? Well, who is it going to be? Is it going to be the other person that sits in the de desk beside me? Because there's only about two of us in town who can do it. Um, you know, it's particularly if it's cognitive as opposed to anything else. And the second question is, and I come back to it, is it's, I mean, let's talk about the evidence about which cognitive assessment I'm going to do that actually makes an, uh, an evaluation of someone's driving. Is it going to be trails B? Is it going to be a uh, f free recall test? I is it going to be a visuospatial test? I mean, I do those in global assessment, but M we, know, we already know that the MMSE score you know, nobody could make a rule. The London, the, the, was it Lookberg, the, the Ludberg group said, OK, an MSE score less than 10, no driving. I think I could probably cope with that. But the, after the MSE score less than 10, it wasn't clear whether it was going to be 18 or 26 or anything else. Um, you know, then they said, well, maybe it's 26 plus another neurological condition. You should get it, get it reviewed by a specialist. Well, I, I need to understand, and I think that we're going to all need to understand, which cognitive tests we can do other than a, an on-road driving, because there aren't enough OTs in the world to do it, um, we can use to make that evaluation. And what are the lawyers going to say at the end of it? I mean, I think you're right, Morris. I, I, I just hold out my hat, hopefully, that there's a professional acceptance of the fact that we're doing what we can with limited, limited, limited evidence. But I'm not sure that a lawyer in a court is necessarily going to want to accept that when they're working for a plaintiff. <laughs> There's a difference between, firstly, there's a difference between working for a plaintiff and the criminal jurisdiction. In criminal jurisdictions, it's much more black and white and it's got to be beyond reasonable doubt and it's going to be very hard to prove. Um, in a civil case where you're being sued for damages, well, it goes on the balance of probability and if you can argue um, about the probabilities of your decision and about how you came to them, then, then that should be enough to get you out of trouble, bearing in mind that you can never predict the outcome of a court case. I think. Um, there's also the issue of, of sort of medicine as an art and as an overall assessment of a person. I mean, you can do as many tests as you can and get numbers at the end of them and scores, but ultimately part of that has got to be your own impression of a person coming from years of experience as a specialist in the field, seeing people with cognitive deficits all the time. And, you know, you do get a certain um, part of that which is, you know, something that you can't easily quantify. There will always be a chunk of patients that are really easy to say no, such as your, your person below a score of 10, and there'll be a chunk of people that it's easy to say yes, who might have an MMSE of you know, 30 or 29 or something, um, and, and, and just have a problem with mental arithmetic and everything else is fine. Um, and then there's gonna be this gray area in between, and there will always be the need to have further assessments. The, um, the aim of getting an over the desk medical test that's going to predict crash risk all the time is the holy grail of of you know, cognitive assessment and will probably never happen. So the best you can do is, really the best you can do is to, is to um, you know, give an assessment based on your knowledge and experience and if you think a person needs a test, so be it. Um, and if they don't, well, if you've documented the reason for your decision, also so be it. I just think that there's something that's missing here and I think that your point is quite valid. However, it is a shared responsibility and if somebody's going to be held accountable for a death, then they're going to make uh, sufficient inquiries into all, all the shared, um, all the people that are involved in that shared responsibility. They're not, um, I know from my past experience when I need to go to court to give evidence that I'm giving an opinion based on my experience as a police officer. So I think that that's what they would be looking for, your experience as a surgeon, doctor, whatever. Um, and therefore they'll, they'll uh, take that on board accordingly. But there's more than one element to finding out fault in an inquiry. And it is a shared responsibility. And I don't think that if, if you've done everything that you believe is um, professional, then um, I don't believe how anybody, I don't see how anybody could be seriously criticised or crucified for making the decisions that they've made. Yeah, look, I'd have to agree. And just, just to add a little bit, Mark, um, I think that Morris is right. If, uh, particularly in the, in the face that there's no statutory obligation to, to report, um, I think that if it's a well-considered uh, medical opinion, a well-documented opinion, I think from a legal perspective, it would be fairly easily able to defend that. Um, there are grey areas and the law is uncertain though, so 
I've got a question that actually follows on from what you're discussing at the moment. I'm a geriatrician out at Western Health and have been looking quite closely at the um, new guidelines um, and looking particularly at the medical condition notification form because we're going to be using this on quite a regular basis now that we have to notify all cases of dementia. And I just had a question for Morris and Tricia about the, the requirement in this. I mean, I know the form is just a guide, but it says that um, when we are notifying that somebody has dementia, we have to document any license conditions or restrictions that we would advise for um, the person. I'm just wondering how broad that is and how much we should be expecting to advise as geriatricians, considering we haven't done an on-road assessment, we've done a cognitive assessment and an assessment of their health in the, in, uh, in the clinic room. Um, they've given a few examples, but I'm just wondering how far we actually go with that and if there's any guidance going to come out about what we should be recommending. Massively broad-ranging question because every patient is different. You know, sometimes you'll see someone and it's, and it's really obvious, um, you know, that you need to give him some sort of a restriction. And sometimes um, it's not so obvious and perhaps they might need some other kind of assessment in order to guide you. You know, they might need to have an OT test or a vision test or whatever. And the primary uh, diagnosis which you've just made of dementia is enough to notify them or, you know, the fact that they... Uh, you know, that they need to be told in the first place that they've got this diagnosis. If it's at a very early stage, they might still have enough insight to understand their, their own responsibility. You're not the one with the responsibility to report. Um, and, um, you know, actually specifying what their, what their uh, restriction is is not, I think, all that important. If, if you have specified restrictions, well and good. Otherwise, it's just enough that VicRoads finds out about them. The intention of having regular review now of people with dementia is an acknowledgement that um, the condition will probably deteriorate over time. Nobody really knows how much it's going to deteriorate or how fast it's going to deteriorate. Um, and that these people shouldn't be lost to follow up. You know, that's the real worry that, you know, somebody gets a diagnosis and then is never heard about again until something nasty's happened. So, the intention is that one day, sure, these people might need to have further um, investigation or um, have an OT test or whatever, but just the fact that they've been diagnosed doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to end up in this whirlpool of investigation and bureaucratic hassle. I guess Vic Rhodes, as Morris said before, is just after all the information they can get. So if you have an opinion on what sort of restrictions would suit this person, then Vic Rhodes would like to know what your opinion is. At the end of the day, we'll decide the restriction. I mean, you could tick, you know, you might tick um, OT uh, test not required, but we might decide it is and vice versa. Um, and yeah, so I think uh, if you, you've got insight into this person and you think that perhaps it's early onset dementia uh, at this stage and that surely uh, you know, be safe to drive in their own area, but perhaps you wouldn't like them driving to Melbourne, then, you, then it's a recommendation that you can make to Vic Rhodes. But at the end of the day, Vic Rhodes will decide what sort of restrictions they have, but they are interested in your uh, medical opinion. You might get a phone call that says, well, you know, we've got five police reports saying that this person's been having little bingles, you know, that aren't necessarily known to you at the time too. It's always a good practice to, to report and, and get a professional to actually do the evaluation. Yes. Again, like I say, if you're a medical doctor, you're not expected to be an expert in driving. You're an expert in medicine. So it's your duty to report the medical condition and let Vic Road or the OT actually decide what to do with that information. Yes, it's the same. Uh, a lot of our engineers are told to go out and inspect the road, and they will go and see how big a pothole before you actually need to close down the road. I mean, you just report that there is a hole this size or the slope is a bit too steep with so, so many degree, someone should actually come out and do something or have a second look. Yes, I think that's what they are looking for from auditor or, or from the first frontline people who do the inspection or the frontline people who do the initial report. Yes, I think if you are called out to explain yourself and you documented that this is based on this information and I send this information up, yeah. I think that's what a normal jury or a judge would say, okay, you did your, your duty correctly or professionally and then I think you're safe that way. Uh, is Vic Rhodes equipped to deal with the large, I guess the volume of, of notifications that are likely to come through? Um, they're, they're always uh, um, 
short-staffed at Vic Roads and at the moment um, there's a sustainable government initiative being conducted where we have to lose 400 staff from Vic Roads and as do other government departments so uh, we're probably going to have less resources uh, rather than uh, than uh, the ones we've got now or, or more so but it doesn't mean that we don't want you to, re to, to report people into our system we really we really want the high risk people reported into our system so that we can deal with them so let us worry about the resources and, and you just um, uh, report right. people that, um, that um, haven't reported themselves. I'm working in an acute hospital and I recently had a patient who had a temporary diagnosis of vertigo and is under investigation. Now um, I brought to the, to the doctor's attention his ability to drive that was impaired after doing a functional assessment and he couldn't even walk or turn his head without falling off the chair. Um, so I, I, the recommendation was made that he temporarily stop driving until a formal diagnosis had been made. He was non-compliant according to the social worker. Where do my, where, where do my obligations stand when it is a sort of an, an acute diagnosis? It hasn't, he, a, a diagnosis as such hasn't been made. Um, you said to report things that are major medical conditions. If something like vertigo that doesn't have a, a cause um, or a label attached to it, what, what, where do I stand? I have to say that as a member of the Victorian Police Force, we've got a very thankless job, which I'm sure a lot of doctors and surgeons have as well. And the one thing that we're taught from the very first day that we walk into the academy is to keep good notes. And I think that the elephant just walked out the room with me just saying that because if you've written, if you, you are keeping a, a very good diary, there is not one person that could come back and criticise you if you've done the right thing and you've kept notes about it. Uh, the thing that worries me is that we're so concerned about our professional responsibility, we're not thinking about the person's leaving the hospital, has got vertigo, is going to drive. I've written all of my notes and I've notified Vic Roads by post and I said, oh, the, the GP will take care of it. And then I'm sitting thinking, oh, lucky I don't live in town and... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, can I call the... Po what, do I, what do I do then? So. So do I call the police and how much more work does that make for you? You're well within your rights to do that. Like as a, um, a health professional, if somebody's left your office and you've got some grave concerns in regard to how that person may behave on the road, um, as a police officer, we will attend to that um, call. Um, our power to take them off the road there and then is probably um, non-existent. However, we can push it up with that licence review and try to start the process in regard to getting that person off the road. Um, if they are a danger on the road, we can certainly, um, uh, we can, oh, what's the correct word? We can certainly um, stall their activity on the road. So um, don't, don't, um, don't hold back by giving the police a call and, and saying that you've got concerns. Um, the other thing too, I guess, is the other people on the road that, that, that may be endangered by that person's um, behaviour or driving ability. Um, that's obviously of a concern as well. Um, nine times out of ten, if um, they've left the, the clinic or, or surgery and um, you've made a phone call and we've gone around to investigate it just to do a welfare check, if not anything else, um, that nine times out of ten will probably um, intimidate that person to the point that they may think that the risk is higher than the actual gain. So um, it, there are, there's no right or wrong answer in regard to any of this. However, you've just got to do what you think is best at the time, back your judgment and keep notes. Yeah, can I just add to that? Firstly, I mean, I, I a thousand percent endorse the comment about keeping notes. You, you must keep good notes. It's the, the best protection anybody can have. Just write it down. So many times we see crappy notes, you know, it, and in, you know, serious cases where there are serious medical issues in all sorts of forensic and police cases and, um, you know, could all have been avoided by just writing it down properly. And, you know, I think sometimes using computerised notes doesn't help because people tend to not write as much <clears throat> when they've got to type it into computers, back in the old days when doctors wrote everything down, even if the handwriting was terrible, at least they wrote it down. 
um, you know, you must keep good notes. As far as people with an acute disability like this is concerned, the section of the Road Safety Act about notifying conditions really applies to long-term chronic conditions. But if Vic Roads gets notification, especially from a health professional, um, that a person's not safe, they can act quickly to suspend a licence. So I don't think they can act instantaneously. If somebody in the health um, profession sends them a fax that says so and so is unsafe, they won't get a fax back by return saying they're cancelled. Vic Roads is obliged to give people a certain amount of time um, and, and, and that can be kept to a, a minimum. I'm not sure what the minimum is, but it's several days at least, I think, just to cover letters in the post and other bits and pieces. But Vic Roads can act quickly um, and insist on uh, a supportive medical report before they get their licence back again. Once Vic Roads has acted, the police can then act because they've got a legal basis to stop a person driving if they haven't got a licence. Okay. Thank you. I think my question was mostly answered in that last discussion. But I just wanted to clarify, in terms of working on a busy, um, say, a neurological ward where we constantly have patients coming in who are expected to comply with driving restrictions for a certain period of time, and most of the time it would be on the background of a chronic medical condition. Um, just wanting to check, we usually only fill out this Vic Rhodes medical form. Sorry, I'm an occupational therapist. And I would only ever you fill out that form or request a doctor to fill out that form. Um, if there were significant concerns about a driving assessment being needed, um, an OT driving assessment, or concerns about a client's capacity and the fact that they won't inform Vic Roads. Am I okay to explain to the patient their expectations and the legalities of, that they're not meant to be driving and for them to say, yes, I'll tell Vic Roads myself and I'll document that and, expect, and be happy with them telling Vic Roads themselves? Like, do, we, do we have to fill out a form for everyone? <laughs> it just seems like a whole lot more work. If you tell people that they shouldn't be driving or that they need to notify Vic Roads and they're worried, they'll often say, oh, that's fine, I'll do it. And, and you can't be certain that they do. Look, if you've got doubts, it doesn't hurt to try and check up. Yeah. You know, give them a call in a week or two and just say, I just want to make sure. And, and look, if you've got any doubts, you can't get yourself into trouble by notifying Vic Roads. You can't, you, know, you can't be sued. And, and, if, and if you've got good notes, keep notes, make sure you write it all down. And if you r really are concerned, it doesn't hurt to send a form into Vic Roads. Sure, as a, prof a health professional that you can, um, obviously, like you say, if you had doubts, but at the end of the day, if the person's got capacity, it surely is their individual responsibility. Just to give you an example, there was a fellow I saw at St V's last year who was a truck driver who had epilepsy now. He was completely fine when I saw him, but his seizures were coming fairly frequently and I told him he couldn't drive his truck and he had to notify Vic Rose. He said, sure, I'll do it, I'll do it. Um, and you know, he had full cognition, but he also had a really powerful motive for not notifying Vic Rhodes and in fact he didn't and I ended up doing it about a week or two later because um, you know there was a, a public health issue concerned. On the issue of documentation is all well and good but you've still got to behave reasonably Yeah. and, and so that if you see a, a risk to your patient or a risk to the community I, I don't think that someone's got capacity is enough to um, say that I, I did everything I could that that's not everything that you can. And I think it's about recognising some people need a bit of time to comprehend the idea, the follow-up, but we've got to be reasonable through all of this. So, so writing notes saying that I've told him and I'm absolved of it and I know he's just going to, isn't, isn't be behaving reasonably. And as a health professional, the expectation is that we will take into account both the individual and the community's health. I mean, maybe it's the geriatrician in me, but I, I, I hate to think we lose the patient-centred focus of, of this discussion. I mean, in, certainly in my experience in the Cadams clinics, 90% of older people choose, and I think there's some evidence about, uh, I don't know whether it's 90%, but certainly a very high proportion of older people choose to stop driving at the right time. Um, and, if, and so that's the first thing I think we ought to assess. The second thing is in relation to that particular case, you know, the social worker said that so-and-so was going to drive, you know. How the hell do we know? I mean. And, and so if the, if the patient themselves, if the patient themselves have got insight, I mean, OK, let's try and work out what the patient's background is and let's try and understand the patient a bit more. But if the patient has got capacity and has got insight into the problem, and there are really significant issues for this patient, they know if they turn their head they get vertigo, but I can drive using my mirrors without turning my head and this is what I'm going to try and do. 
and they want to try and do that. What? What about when you turn a corner again? Well, I mean, you know, I've seen a lot of people turn corners slowly, but, but you know, if, 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 they, if, they live, if they live up in the country and there's no other way to get some basic supplies, I mean, maybe they shouldn't have gone home in the first place, but I think we've got to be thinking a little bit more around the needs of the patient and try and balance risk. And we do this all the time. That's the question I'm really answering, because I think I have to balance risk every day in my Cadams clinic in relation to driving. And that's about trying to manage the risks, uh, of the loss of independence to a person with the potential risk. And all, look, it's small. If you look at the total number of people here, even in total, people over the age of 75 have no more risk than 25-year-olds on the road. Um, now, you know, do we take every, do we reassess every 25-year-old until they become safe enough to drive? We don't. So I, th I think that we have to take a, a logical approach. And my problem with the way the system works is that if we drive this down guidelines where everybody who thinks, oh, we're going to just send a note into Vic Roads, Vic Roads, for all their for all their kindness we see here and the true human nature of Vic Roads, the bureaucracy doesn't act like that. And I've had numerous patients who are in absolute distress because they've been given three weeks to get a geriatrician assessment and there's not a hope in hell of getting a geriatrician assessment in this town in under six to eight. So I just want to go back to relaying information to the patient and how we can do this better on the ground. And um, you may have alluded to this earlier. Is there a, an actual quick reference source that I can um, access on my ward round, um, which, for example, I can just click on a condition and it will bring up a guideline for to, that I can then print out and supply to the patient on the ward round. And then I know that it, I, that's done and I can then document th that in my medical notes. Uh, is there such a resource or is there a plan for a resource? Can I ask, is it reasonable to be making the decision in hospital and, and should we, so if we use the example of home oxygen, so you know people are hypoxic in hospital but we don't say that you're going to be on home oxygen forever until they've had a time to recuperate and recover. And so is it reasonable to say, um, I'm not going to make a formal assessment or a notification of Vic Roads. <laughs> we really need to wait six weeks and see what your recovery is like. Absolutely. If you think that this is a temporary condition and they're going to recover, you don't need to notify Vic Roads about it. And if that's your professional opinion and you're confident that that's going to happen, then there's no need to notify Vic Roads. They're only really interested in chronic conditions forever. I've got a patient at the moment who's had lots of episodes of syncope and so I'm giving him advice he's got to be symptom free for a period and then go to his GP to then actually sort of make sure that he's actually okay to go back and drive. I'm not going to notify Vic Road straight away. And that would seem to follow your, your approach there as well. In the UK some years ago, the survey, I think, was printed, I think was printed in the British Medical Journal of um, people who had syncope to see whether they followed their doctor's advice and they found a 100% non-compliance rate. <laughs> So the legislation is worded, it says any long-term or permanent injury or illness that may affect driving. So that's, that's what you've got to uh, keep in mind when you're working out what to report. Thank you. We saw graphs this morning um, about the very high risk age group of people um, having motor vehicle accidents or injuries and it was in that, from memory, the first year after a licence was granted. And for those whose mandate includes improving road safety, I'm just um, keen to know what else as a community we can do to reduce that 28% of fatalities among 14% of the drivers in the 18 to 25 year age group, please. And I think it was mentioned earlier that while well, a lot of the focus here has been on older drivers, you're exactly right that the real problem on our road, well, the bigger problem on our roads is young drivers. Um, and a lot of that comes around inexperience and a false sense of confidence that comes with that. So um, the, the, our the big thing that we really try and push with the younger drivers is education. It's why there's 120 hours for um, uh, under the learner permit scheme at the moment before a, a person can even get their um, licence. Uh, we've got lots of education programs in the school, in, in all the school programs, and that they start from uh, early in the high school years. Uh, we have even, even in primary school, we have um, a much different type of education program, but um, I think for those younger drivers it is all about education and experience um, and so we try and push that from a 
a prevention point of view, with our marketing campaigns, um, with our program safety campaigns that we have in the communities and in the schools. Um, we work with Vic Roads and Victoria Police um, in other areas in terms of road design. We work with vehicle manufacturers in terms of trying to design safer cars. Um, so it's a multi-pronged approach to that. But in terms of your specific question about younger people, I think it's give them as much experience as you can and give them as much education as you can. Many years ago when my children were younger, there was a program over at, out at the airport where they, it was just a bike program. But something like that where they go on to have so many classes, sessions, whatever, for the first 12 or 18 months, to where they come into situations that they're not going to come into with their mother beside them for 120 hours or whatever. When they're on their own and they've got a, they've got these uh, near accidents or skidding or those sort of things where they can have extra education. The types of, just on that question, the types of programs you're talking about are commonly known as defensive driving programs and TSC aren't in favour of those. Um, the research, and I don't work in our road safety area but I work very closely with them, but um, some of the research um, certainly suggests that it can actually over, in, increase the overconfidence of younger drivers and that's a concern. So um, the idea isn't a bad one and, but there's some mixed thoughts about uh, whether that's the right approach or not. Certainly with the driver programs that we fund under our rehab programs that I mentioned earlier, we don't fund defensive driving programs. Yeah. So I want to concur with those comments. The research does show that the kids who take part in the advanced driving courses have a higher crash involvement than those who didn't. Because, and it's, it's because they're overconfident. They're, they think they're invincible. So, yeah, we're um, big roads TIC against all, against all of that. For a lot of drivers, there are two main deficits. One is skill deficit, one is attitude deficit. Okay, and a lot of these advanced training costs focus primarily on the skills, and if you improve the skills too high, they are overconfidence and then they get into trouble. I think today a lot of this driver education system is slowly moving towards addressing the more important issue, the attitude deficit. Yes, and so you, when you sign up your kit for a advanced training course, make sure that the, the program is covering the risk management and attitude management more than the skill set. As a nurse who does community assessments, I guess my question is if we've been out and seen someone who we think has got an impaired cognition, who the family have got concerns about driving, our general um, rule of thumb at the moment is to handball to the GP, so you'll put a note to the GP. Is that enough for us? Or uh, I've never seen these forms that the, the OTs and the, the geriatricians and GPs are filling out, so is it something that we should be doing as well if we have concerns in saying that that's not our area of expertise? So if the family are giving us concerns and, and the, the evidence we've collected highlight some issues for us, where, where do we go? Is, is highlighting to the GP enough? The human rights element, everybody has the right to be able to drive if they're able to. Uh, and I believe that if you've got family, because l let's face it, our family are probably the most honest people in our lives. If they're saying that we're having a difficulty carrying out a skill, I think that that's probably at that position you need to be listening. Um, and then the human rights element, well, that person does have a right to drive. So you've got to make a professional judgment in regard to where you think that fits. There, I don't believe that there's a right or a wrong answer in any of this. It comes down to um, each case should be judged on its merit and you take it from there. You take on board everything, all the evidence that's pre presented to you at the time and you make the best professional judgment that you think that you're able to do and let um, it go on to the other um, areas that will make that judgement on that person's behalf, that have the power to. First of all, I think that it's interesting to note that overconfidence in a young person is called lack of insight. In an old, in, sorry, well, overconfidence in a younger person is described as lack of insight in an older person. Um, and I think we need to be very careful about how ageist we are in the way we approach the language around driving capability. I think while the vast majority of older drivers uh, make appropriate choices about when they should stop driving, and dementia is a very common condition in older age, we should also allow that possibility without undue bureaucratic restrictions. 
And finally, until the older driver, especially the rural older driver, uh, older drivers are given guaranteed real options that maintain their community engagement, this will continue to be a problem for us as a community. Um, personally, I'd just like to thank everybody for including me in today. I wish that I could have been here all day because I think it could have been quite beneficial to my professional role. Um, in regard to the older driver, I, I concur um, with Mark and um, that's pretty much all I have to say. So thank you very much for including me in today. Um, I, I don't envy for one moment the, the work that you have to do and the conflicts that you face in this, um, in this area in terms of your, the, the confidentiality and the privacy um, obligations you have to your patients as opposed to the public safety issues that we've raised as well and the independence and the autonomy that um, patients like Mark has, have out in the rural communities. But I see every day of the week um, the consequences of what happens after someone's had a road accident and uh, I think anything that any of us can do to try and prevent an accident and from, prevent people from being injured, uh, we should do that. So, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'd just like to echo, to echo those sentiments about how pleased I am to be invited along to a session like this because I think that raising awareness um, of medical fitness to drive is always very important. I think there are conflicting requirements or con conflicting aims in, in, in this whole situation. One is to preserve people's mobility as much as possible. The other one is to preserve public health and safety as much as possible. In most cases, those two aims are completely well defined and distinct and it's relatively easy to make the decisions in the grey area in between when, when you've got to try and compromise one or the other um, is where uh, organisations like VicRoads Medical Review and ourselves get involved and hopefully um, we can help make those decisions in the right direction. Thanks. From Vic Road's perspective, um, we're not trying to take people off the road. We want people to be able to drive for as long as they're safe to do so. So um, I want to make that point. And um, the people that we want off the road are the medically impaired people. So this, this issue isn't about older drivers, it's about medically impaired drivers. And they can be medically impaired at any age. So as health professionals, we want you to, to help get those medically impaired people into our system so that we can assess them and determine whether they're safe to drive or not. Thanks. So I think we have heard uh, frequent enough that uh, driving is actually a very important to the well-being of uh, of people and it's also a very major engine for the economy and so my view is that driving should not be restricted without good reason. Okay. And we are here, most of you are health professionals and, and your job is to assess somebody's fitness to drive. Okay. And I just want to point out one fact. Okay. If a health professional make a mistake, you kill them one at a time. If an engineer make a mistake, you kill people by hundreds and thousands when the building collapses. So let's take some comfort in that. Um, as you know, I've, I've already told you I had a stroke and this means my hand doesn't work and my leg doesn't work real well. The officer came to and told me you have to give up your licence for, for six months, which the neurologist explained and my doctor explained. I didn't have anyone explain that from the um, TAC, no, the Vic Roads. And um, now I'm waiting seven months <laughs> and I still don't have my licence back. <laughs> So um, good luck with all of you and what you do because I think you're doing a wonderful job uh, yourselves to put other people um, on or off the road as they need be. So, so thank you. I guess I just wanted to make two points. One was to recognise that I think for health professionals, our anxiety is that whilst Vic Roads is making the ultimate licensing decision, they are not the people that are sitting in front of the patient. So I think our concern comes when we are the ones that have to explain the process and explain what's going to happen, and we take the brunt of that face-to-face -face contact. Whilst we can say, oh, look, it wasn't me, it was Vic Rose, they can say, yeah, but you told them. <laughs> so that's the reality that we deal with. And I think that's where we get this real disquiet between our rapport with our patient and the difficulty and the reality of explaining uh, 
what is for them a, a bureaucratic system, not a face-to-face a -face personal system for them. And I think that when it is something as meaningful as, and as, as important as driving, that's where a lot of the anxiety lies. Second point was just that, uh, just to kind of reiterate, that the OT driving assessment is for a small proportion of patients. So sometimes I get worried when we're in a room this big that I'm going to suddenly get 500 referrals next week for driving assessments because it's on everybody's brain. But the OT assessment is not always the most appropriate route uh, for people to travel. Those conditions should be reported to Vic Roads and then they'll make a determination about whether or not that assessment's actually possible. So we cannot assess everybody that you have a concern about and it's not our role. So I just wanted to reiterate. <laughs> I think no matter how hard it is, I'd rather hear that I couldn't drive or have having trouble driving from my doctor or therapist or the nursing staff rather than have to go to Vic Roads and have someone tell me I can't drive. And we're better trained, better equipped to do that. Um, and I think, as I said, as hard as it is, it's better that we do it than leave it to someone that the patient doesn't know or understand. Um, so with that, I'd say thank you to everyone. The fruit baskets are for the speakers, although there's a wealth of them, it's not for everyone. <laughs> um, and thank you very much. Drive safely.